even one more chance. Shalom Aleichem, my friends. So, I've been off Facebook for quite a while. And many people have sent messages here locally in Toronto and really from around the world. Especially from around the world, asking where I was and what was going on. So, in short, <laughs> when I travel overseas, I don't post anything on Facebook to honor my wife's wishes that we don't broadcast to the whole world that we're not home. Uh, we left last Wednesday night to go to Berlin, Germany, for our son, the eldest son, Zevi's wedding. And everything seemed kind of normal, except that about 20 minutes after we landed, we got to the airport here in, in Toronto, somebody gave us a call and said, you know, Trump, the president, just announced that he's closing all air traffic. And nobody's going to be able to go from the United States, which means, of course, my son, who's in the States, the Hassan, will not be at his wedding. And we were thrown into a frenzy, which continued until we actually took off. We arranged for our boys who were in the United States to fly on Thursday night. And at this point, everything started to unravel. By the time we landed in Germany on, on Thursday late evening, we already knew that half of the attendees had canceled the wedding. And so it continued through Friday. And Matzai Shabbos on Saturday night, just when a beautiful Shabbos came to an end, we were informed that the wedding was essentially canceled. And there was only going to be 50 people allowed to attend. So, yet you have to understand, now this is already uh, 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 understood, anticipated. This is what we call the normal run of the mill, unfortunately. But we really kind of were ahead of the curve we were the first first ones like that we didn't hear of anything like this and you know there was a there was a good deal of unhappiness and you're dealing with a, a bride and a groom and and despondency and anticipations and hopes dashed and I made a decision right there and then together with my wife that regardless of what was going to come our way we were going to choose to be happy and we were going to choose to celebrate with the Hassan and Kala because that's the right thing to do. And it's not about us. It's about them. And I'm sharing this with you because it is the first and perhaps most important point in a coping strategy. Nobody is particularly enjoying the current situation. And that would be an understatement. There are many of you who are cooped up with small children, and that's difficult. I know we have small children, Baruch Hashem. There are many of you who are lonely. I think I don't know what that is. There's lots of people in this house. But that can be very, very difficult. It can be very painful. There are those of you who are missing extended family and friends. It's very easy to let the situation bring you down. But I want to tell you that, as a matter of fact, that we chose not to let the situation bring us down. We chose to focus on what was right and what was good and what should be done. And we did it because human beings are capable of doing that. Human beings have the capacity of mayach shalit al halev. This is a, a basic ability that God gives each and every one of us. The Alter Rebbe sees it as a foundational ingredient in Avedis Hashem. Our minds can control our hearts whether it means taking bitter medicine that you don't like, whether it means controlling your anger or your frustration when you know you might lose your job or a very, very important friendship. If you open your mouth at the wrong time, you want to, you want to mouth off. You want to yell, you want to scream, but your mind tells you otherwise. And we all do this without even realizing that we're practicing the Aleph base of Hasidus. We're all experiencing and exhibiting Mayach Shalat Al Halev. The mind can and should rule the heart. We don't do whatever we feel like doing or act on a whim. Then you wouldn't use the washroom. I mean, you just do whatever you wanted, wherever you wanted, however you wanted. And very small children do that. But we are all endowed with the ability 
to control ourselves. And we're endowed with the ability to decide how we are going to live our lives. So that's the first thing that I want to say. The truth is this is unusual for me. I've, uh, I have the privilege, Baruch Hashem, of teaching people Torah on this medium and other mediums. Ahead of the curve for a number of years now. I think I must be going on three or four years already. And many of you are probably used to seeing lots of svar and lots of books, not just behind me, but in front of me. <laughs> I do have a couple of books in front of me. But I don't, I don't have uh, as many svarim as usual, and this isn't going to be a formal share. Uh, I'll tell you a little secret. I'm, I'm actually racked with pain inside right now, and I'm, I'm not feeling very well. Uh, I'm not sure what I have yet. I'll find that out. I've been tested. I'll find out. But it's not exactly, I'm not on top of my game. The reason that I, I wanted to take this opportunity to reach out to all of you and to connect with all of you is because I think this is a time in which we all have to ask what we can do for another. And if, if we have words or ideas that can calm other people, that can elevate other people, that can inspire other people, that can comfort other people, then it's our sacred duty to put ourselves aside and ask what we can do for others. And this is really the first point that I wanted to make. It's, uh, it's interesting. It's interesting that one of the scariest things about this whole virus is that you can have it without even knowing it. And you can communicate it to somebody else without even being aware that you just harmed somebody. I think one of the most difficult things that I've heard from people over the last maybe two or three days is the notion that they should be separated from their grandchildren. Most people, by the time their grandparents, are in their 60s, maybe 70s. And it gets much dangerous, much, much more dangerous. As, as time goes on, as, as we get older, apparently this, this virus can be much more debilitating. And I mean, this is a famous, uh, it's a message, a voice message. It may have been a video as well. I, I, I'm not sure. From Naftali Bennett, from the Minister of Defense in Israel, who makes this impassioned plea for people not not to be in touch with their grandchildren, not, not to kiss their grandchildren. And, and it's a very difficult thing. Like, the, the grandchildren seem fine. The kids are crying. They want to see Bubby, Zaidi, Saba, or Safta. The grandparents are, are craving that closeness and the opportunity to share that love, and, and they have to be separate. And we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, but it's eminently possible that Pesach can come around and Chas V'Shalom, this can still be going on. And that would mean that you'll have parents and grandparents and grandchildren that will be separated from each other for the Seder. It's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not the way the Torah says it should be. But the Torah also says that Pikuach Nefesh, that saving life, is Deicha, is able to transcend, it must transcend the entire Torah. If a person is not well, they eat on Yom Kippur. And if there's a danger of people becoming ill, well, then families won't be together for the Seder. And the amazing thing is that the children might not have any symptoms. You might not even know that you're a carrier, and yet you can be infecting somebody. This is especially true if people are immunocompromised. So, so I was thinking that there has to be always a, a, a positive message that we can derive. Not to say that there's anything positive about the situation. I, I wrote about this on Friday, actually sick in bed. And and uh, it's it's gotten it's gotten out a little bit, and uh, most of you have probably read it already. I want to re-emphasize again that, that it absolutely rankles me. It's a uh, it's awful. I think that people are calling this positive. It's a, it's a terrible thing. This is this is an awful situation. There's a, an ocean of human suffering. There's there's illness. There's suffering. There's death. It's terrible. This is a terrible, terrible situation. And we don't know the ways of Hashem, and we don't know what's going on. But there's nothing good about this per se. It is not a good situation. But the Torah still charges us 
to find good things, to find good things even in bad situations, because that's 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 the mandate that Hakadosh Baruch Hu puts upon us. And I was reminded of a story that happened many years ago, a story in which I did something good without really realizing it, and only by Hashgacha Pratas, or I guess what people would call a coincidence, which I say is in a level letter name for God, did it ever end up coming back to me even? And the story goes like this. It must be about 15 years ago. And there was a group of police officers who came to, to our show, to Chabad Flamingo. And I spoke to them. I spoke to them about the, the seven Noachide laws, the seven mitzvahs. And, and uh, I answered many questions. And amongst the things, I, you know, I said, since you're police officers, you should always have as much information as possible. I said, I can't tell you what to do with that information. But, but as a chaplain, I know what you face. And I know that when you come into a set of circumstances in the know, you're able to make a, a well-informed decision. And I asked the, the officers, it must have been 50 or 60 officers, I said, suppose you were to pull somebody over and they told you that they're going to their mother's funeral. Would you ticket them? Would you, would you leave them? Or would you maybe ask for proof? Would you try to help them get there? What would you do? And just about everybody said, well, you know, that's, that will be called an exception. That's different. That's, that's you know, you're really not a lot of speed and it's not appropriate, but if somebody is going for their parents' funeral, like, we, we would understand that. So I said, so I just want to tell you about a circumstance, and I don't know what will happen, but you should be aware of this. You should know this for, for your own edification, and you'll make the decision you have to make. And I explained to them about Shabbat. And I explained to them that when Shabbat comes, we, we, can't, we can't drive. It's a violation of the Torah. And, and, I, and I told them a story that had happened um, not long before, where I had gone to visit somebody in the hospital on Friday afternoon. They were very, very sick at the time. And the traffic on the, on the, the 404 was terrible. And it was literally like a parking lot. And I'm, I'm looking nervously at my watch, and candle lighting was something like about 4.35. And usually I, I would have had no problem getting home, but in the traffic that I was facing, I, I started looking at the real prospect of not getting home in time for Shabbos. And it was about at least 10 below outside, or maybe 15 below, freezing cold. It wasn't snowing, but it was very, very cold. And I, I made a decision to drive on the, sh on the shoulder. And I said, listen, if, if you would have pulled me over, you, you ticket me. I, fi I figure, what's the worst thing? I'll get ticketed, I'll get ticketed. Uh, either way, I'm gonna have to walk home on Shabbos. And the officer stops me and says, you mean to say that if, if you would not have gotten home on time for the Sabbath, you would have walked home in, in, in that weather? I said, absolutely. It was not, not even a question. I said, what would you do with your keys? I said, my wallet, my keys would have gone underneath the mat. I would pull the car over and that would be the end of that. Baruch Hashem, I didn't get pulled over on that day and I did make it home for Shabbos. But I wanted them to be aware that there's something called Shabbos. And I said, if you should see a person who looks observantly Jewish, a Jewish man or woman, and you pull them over and they're speeding and they say, look, I'm sorry, officer, it's almost Shabbos. You should know that they're not lying. There, there is such a thing. You may, you may have to ticket them. You, you do what you have to do. I can't tell you what to do. You're officers of the law. You'll do as you're supposed to. But I want you to be aware of this. That's what, I, that's what I shared with him. And that was the end of the story, or so I thought. And many, many months later, my wife gets a call from a friend of hers who says, sorry, my wife got a call from a sister of hers who heard from a friend of hers who is teaching in a school together with co-teaching in a nursery school. And, and the other teacher was not particularly favorably disposed towards Chabad. Unfortunately, this is a, something with a diminishing return, Baruch Hashem, more and more there's a greater achdos, there's a unity and love amongst Jewish people, but we still have some rough edges. And anyway, at the point was, this was, this was a, that kind of circumstance. And in fact, this other teacher would often needle the teacher. Um, this other teacher was a Lubavitcher woman, and she would needle her about, you know, Chabad did this, and Lubavitch said that, and so on and so forth. And she noticed that her co-teacher had stopped needling her. And this had gone on for a couple of weeks and it was, it was very odd. <coughs> so, 
So finally, she uh, had the courage and she said, you know, I, I noticed you don't needle me anymore. Can I, can I ask you what that's about? And the woman said, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I have uh, my family, I have a new appreciation for Chabad now, so we decided that we're not going to, we're not going to disparage anymore. And we, we, just, we look at Chabad differently. So this uh, young woman says, why? So she says, well, it's a, it's a long story. So no, I, I'd love to know about it. So she says, well, you know, um, did you, do you know Rabbi Kaplan? So this young woman says, yeah, I, I know who he is. He says, so, so it's something very interesting happened, she says, a, a couple of weeks ago. And my husband was up in Newmarket. I don't know if it was, it was in the courthouse where it was to, to fight a ticket. I, I don't know exactly what it was for, but something like that. And um, he doesn't have a car, and he was waiting for public transport. And it's about 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday. The courtroom was delayed, and, and here he is. And he's really, really nervous. It's 2 o'clock, and he's got to get all the way back to Thornhill on time for Shabbos. And suddenly a cruiser pulls over, and the, door, the window comes down, and the police officer says, um, Where are you going? So he tells him the address in Thornhill he's going. He says, uh, are you Shabbat observant? And the man who is very visibly or you know, observant says, yeah, yeah I, I am. He says, oh, get in the car. I'll, I'll, I'll take you home. And, and this uh, gentleman gets in the cruiser and he says to him, you, you just pick people off the street or are you going there anyway? He says, no, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't pick people off the street. <laughs> and it wasn't really going there. Not exactly. He says, but we have a chaplain. He says, we have a new chaplain, and um, his name is Rabbi Kaplan. And we were at his synagogue a couple of months ago. And he spoke to us about, uh, about Shabbat. And he spoke to us about Friday afternoon. He spoke to us about uh, the winter. And, and he spoke to us about how people could get stuck and have to walk in the cold. And he said, uh, the truth is, I uh, I'd never met a Jew before. Rabbi Kaplan was the first Jew I ever met. But he said, I don't know something about him. is." Uh, he seemed sincere and, and he was engaging and we, I enjoyed the time I spent with him. So I said to myself that if I'll find a Jew who <laughs> needs to get home for Shabbat, I'll try and help. So the truth is, uh, <laughs> obviously, that was never my intention. And uh, I don't even know who this officer is. I've never met him. I've never crossed paths with him. I, I've, never, I've never identified him. And I wouldn't even have known the story if, if, if it wasn't that you know, these two co-teachers were teaching it and somebody noticed that somebody wasn't needling somebody else. It's really like a, a domino effect of Hashgach Pratis. But here's the point. Here, the point. The point was that un, unbeknownst to me and um, without any intention whatsoever, I had the privilege, I had the good fortune of making a difference in somebody else's life and helping somebody get home in time for Shabbos. And... And uh, when it comes to the mitzvah of tzedakah, there's a very interesting halacha. Usually mitzvahs have to be mindful. You intend to do a mitzvah, you get the mitzvah. <laughs> if you don't intend to do the mitzvah, mitzvahs by accident are not necessarily valuable. Uh, the Gemara has a whole discussion about this, whether mitzvahs, tzrichas kavana, ain't tzrichas kavana. If you eat matzah by accident, did you even eat matzah? Is it of any value? But the one mitzvah that doesn't have to have any intention whatsoever is, is tzedakah. And, and the Gemara tells us, and it's a clear halacha, that if you lose money, you lose money. You don't even know you lost the money. And a poor person, a one who is needy, finds that money and uses it to be able to keep body and soul together, that you're credited with the mitzvah as if you would have mindfully given of your wherewithal, of your, of your riches, of your treasure, to help somebody else. And, and the, the phenomenal thing is that you might not even have known you lost the money. You may not even have felt the loss at, at any point in time, but it was yours and you did lose it. So it's like a gift from on high. It's a gift Hashem gives you that you get the mitzvah of tzedakah. And here, here I was, unbeknownst to me, almost, almost that you would call by accident. Uh, you know, I... I was just doing the right thing. I was, I was, I was meeting a group of police officers. I was speaking to them about Sheva Mitzvahs Bnei about the Noahide Code, as the Rebbe told us we should. And and I and I thought that it was wise and prudent and meaningful to utilize the opportunity to speak to them about Shabbos. And 
and, and somebody was helped and somebody was able to keep Shabbos and somebody w was able to avoid the difficulty and the challenge and the pain that he would have had. And it, uh, only, you know, Bahashgacha Pratis did it come back to me. And I, 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 I it was almost like a, I was grateful to Hashem. It was like a gift that, like, why did I even have to know that? Who, sh who could have given me that knowledge? It was a gift. Hashem decided to give me a gift that I don't deserve. But the point I want to make is this. Be kind. Be considerate. Think of others. You may not know how you help somebody. You may not know how meaningful it is when you, when you make a phone call or send a text message or, or if you, you even go and you know, drop something off at somebody's home, somebody who's elderly and can't get out or is quarantined and you assist them. You, you never know what's going on in somebody else's life. You never know what kind of difficulty, what kind of challenge, what kind of issue somebody's facing. You just don't know. You don't know. And you do the right thing. And live selflessly. And live altruistically. And continue to think of others. I mean, if, if a child could accidentally kiss a grandparent and impart a disease that could be fatal, with, of course, no bad intentions. So if something so bad can happen, something so terrible can happen without people being aware of it. Imagine how good things could be. We have this, this rule in Yiddishkeit, Meruba Mida Teva. Goodness always, always outpaces pain and bad and evil and baleful intent. Good is always better. Good is always more powerful. Just as light is always more powerful than darkness. That's the way Hashem endowed this world. It's such a, such a dark world with so much trouble. And yet Hashem, Hashem gave us the gift of photons and the ability for us to see how a little bit, a little bit of light can always dispel a great deal of darkness. And so I wanted to come back on Facebook Live despite the fact that I'm not on top of my game. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I'm not feeling as well as I'd like to, and I hope that I'll be stronger as Hashem in days ahead. But I wanted to share with you, I wanted to share with you a few words, which I hope you'll find inspiring. I wanted you all to know that you can make a world of difference. A world of difference. And here's another thought, something I've, I've shared with some of my show members before. So those of you who heard it already, you'll... You'll bear with me, but, but think about this, you know. We still don't even know how this virus developed. We, we really don't know. But we think it has something to do with, with bats that had the coronavirus. And maybe it went on to a, a pangolin and, and somehow a person ate that. And, and somehow it was passed, maybe through one person. Maybe through one person who ate something they shouldn't have eaten. And one person's lunch has literally brought the world to its knees. I mean, it's like, it's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling that we've never had a clearer example of how a single act can literally transform the world. I mean, we have this idea of the butterfly effect, and we, we, we almost subscribe to it like, like faith because you can't see it. You've never seen it before. The butterfly effect is a, it's a beautiful scientific Theory. It's not something that, it's not something people ever saw before in real time. And here we can see in real time how somebody, it would seem somebody, one person, doing something foolish has literally become the catalyst for so much suffering, so much pain, so much bad, so much death. It's, it's, it's too scary to think about. And that person probably doesn't even know who they are. It may nothing no longer be alive. But the Rambam tells us that we have to know that in every set of circumstances we should see Yid es Atzmei ves Elam Shokel. You have to see, you have to in your mind's eye envision the whole world as being a perfectly balanced situation. A perfectly balanced situation. You know, like those, those old-fashioned scales where everything was perfectly balanced and if you have the exact weight on one side and the exact weight on the other side, 
smallest particle, the smallest volume of weight on either side can weigh the scale down. And the Rambam says, that's how we have to look at a single mitzvah. You know, I, I, the Rebbe would repeat this Rambam with great fervor and great passion. Okay, I'm a chassid. I hear the Rebbe say it. The Rambam says it. It must be so. But I can't remember ever in my life seeing it, seeing it so vividly. We have seen the whole world transformed, possibly forever, by one act, by one mouthful. Imagine what one mitzvah could do. Merubah Midah Teva is a basic cornerstone. It's a basic foundation of our faith. If something bad can be so impactful, it can make such a difference. Al Achas Kama Vakama, how much more so? That every mitzvah, a mitzvah which is a convention, a cherished envelope that Hashem has created for us to be able to nurture and deepen and develop our relationship with Him. That every mitzvah can be the thing that can catalyze a world of good. And imagine if your mitzvah comes along when the world is shakal, perfectly balanced. And imagine if you don't even know what a difference your mitzvah could make. Because we just don't know a lot of times. We have a very, very small perspective, a very, very limited view of things. Because we don't have to see the big picture. It's not about our vision. It's not about uh, what we see. It's not even about what we say. It's about what we do. Sometimes doing is saying, and sometimes doing is doing, but we need to do what Hashem asks of us. And I want to leave you with this. There is a Sefer, a holy book, that contains powerful teachings of the founder of the Hasidic movement, the Baal Shem Tov. And the Baal Shem Tov, the Sefer is called, the Sefer is called Savo Sarivash, which means the Willow Testament, but it really wasn't. It's just a name, it's a euphemism. And it's collected. It's collected. The, the, the verbiage is not necessarily always precise. But the ideas are real and accurate. Baal Shem Tavonian teachings and ideas. And in the very second entry of Tzavah Sarivash, the Baal Shem Tov says, Shivisi Hashem Negdi Summit. Which means... I place Hashem before me at all times. There used to be many Aron Kodesh, many holy arcs in, the, in Europe that were emblazoned with this phrase. Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Summit. I place Hashem before me at all times. Obviously, in times of prayer, we should be placing Hashem before us. But really, always, a person should always, <laughs> he should always put the Creator before him. Every time you have to make a decision. You see yourself standing before Hashem. What does Hashem want? So the Baal Shem Tev offered a different interpretation. Shivisi Hashem, he said. Shivisi, which means literally to place, said the Baal Shem Tev is Lashain Hashsovas. It means equality. Equal. Equalizer. He says the great equalizer. Hishtavus. Hishtavus means everything is equal. The meaning of all things being equal, he says, Bechol Dovar Hameura, in whatever happens, Hakel Shava Etzli, as far as you're concerned, as far as your Avedis Hashem, your mission, your purpose in life is concerned, it should be irrelevant. He says, whether people compliment you, Mishabchem say, be not the Mavaze, say, if they scorn you if they debase you or embarrass you. He says, it doesn't make a difference whether you eat food that's delightful or whether your fare is very simple, just enough to keep body and soul together. He says, Hakol yish Let everything be equal. In other words, the important thing is 
the important thing is to remove the Yitzhahara, to remove the evil inclination at all times. Regardless of what happens. That's from Hashem. It's from Hashem. And Hashem loves us. And therefore, if it's good in Hashem's eyes, then it has to be good in our eyes. Whatever Hashem gives us is a gift. And we should use that gift. We should not ask Hashem for big or small, bright or dark, openly good or not. It makes no difference, as the Baal Tev. A foundation to Avedis Hashem is Shivisi. Shivisi, my friends, Shivisi. As a rule, where should we daven? We should daven in shul. Where else should we daven? How should we be? We should be united. We should be a community. We should be coming together. We should be shaking hands. We should be hugging. We should be embracing. We should be sharing good cheer. That, that's how Yidna is supposed to serve Hashem. The warmth of community is the lifeblood that powers us and gives us a sense of passion and fervor. And now, and now we're, we're in bidud and isolation. And now we're physically separated from one another. One another, we're not able to be coming together in Hashem's home. It's it's Hashem's house. It's it's where we should want to be. It should where we should find our joy, and there should be such a despondency and, and such a disappointment. And yet the Baal Shem Tov tells us, Shivisi. In every moment, we have but one question to ask of ourselves: What does Hashem ask of me now? And we look in the Shulchan Aruch, and the Shulchan Aruch says, Mishadich Adar, and today is the 26th day of Adar. We are still very much in the month in which the Halacha says, Mar bin Basimcha. We should increase in all matters with joy. Figure it out. That's what the Shulchan Aruch says. The Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law says, you should have it at home. That's what the Code of Jewish Law says. The Code of Jewish Law says that you should be spending time with your family because, because the Code of Jewish Law says, the Shulchan Aruch says, Pikuach Nefesh that saving a life is the most valuable thing any of us will ever be able to do. And if medical professionals are telling us that isolation is the way to save lives and that's how we flatten the curve, then that's what we have to do. Shivisi, it makes no difference. If that's the way Hashem wants us to serve Him today, then that's the way we shall serve Him today. If Hashem wants us to serve Him apart from each other physically, but together in spirit and uniting over the super network of social media, then so it shall be. We will serve Hashem in the best way we can in every set of circumstances. And we will live with the hope and the prayer and the optimism that by doing what Hashem asks of us right now, we will emir to Hashem merit to see the coming of Mashiach and to see a time in which all illness, difficulty, deprivation, and darkness will be dispelled forever. A time in which there will be only happiness and only joy and only goodness with the coming of Mashiach, Bimheira, Amen. Thank you.